Hi there, so this is a very brief guide, um, sort of a beginner's guide to installing a leisure battery in your van. Um, I've got pretty much the most basic setup you can get, so I'm going to go over how I've done this and just go over some of the basics here. So the idea obviously is you want to be able to use electricity in the back of your van at your leisure um, without flattening your main starter battery. So. The idea is, I've got a second battery down here in my cupboard and that is charged along with the main battery under the bonnet when I'm driving, but when I'm not driving this is isolated from the circuit automatically and I can use this at my leisure so it doesn't matter if it goes flat, I'll still be able to start up my van which will start charging it again. Okay, so first of all it's worth looking at how your current setup works with your starter battery. Um, so you've got your engine here, obviously. This is driving the crankshaft, which drives this belt, um, which powers the alternator. When the alternator's running, it puts out around about 14.2 volts. This is a little bit oversimplified, but it's fine for our purposes. And that is gonna trickle down this wire into your main battery. Um, the higher voltage is always going to want to trickle over to the lower voltage. It kind of like tries to even itself out, that's how battery charging works. Um, so this setup here is what keeps your current starter battery charged constantly. But we want to add a second battery to this diagram. So here, this is the simplest way of just adding a second battery. So what's going to happen is your alternator is going to send this voltage down the wire here. It will also continue on to charge this. Um, so the charge will continue to go down there and it'll charge both batteries. Your alternator is perfectly capable of charging both batteries in that way. Now, obviously this isn't an ideal setup because what we want to do is we want to use this leisure battery at our leisure, obviously, when the engine's not running, without using this battery. So we want something that separates these two batteries when the engine's not running but connects them both when the engine is running, hence so that they're both being charged. And that's where we add a split charge relay here. Essentially, you could just put a manual switch in here if you wanted to. That would mean every time you stop your engine, you could switch that on manually, and that means that both batteries are being charged. When you switch your engine off, just flick that switch off, and that means you can use this battery at your leisure without worrying about flattening that battery. Now, there are different types of split charge relays you can install here, which saves you having to manually switch that. Personally, I've got a voltage sense relay. That's a sort of a, a smart relay, as it were. So it detects when there's 14.2 volts going down this wire. If there's 14.2 volts, it'll automatically switch on. There'll be a little light on the front, and that means that this will be there'll be a flow going through the positive wire here. So when it drops down to 12.6 volts, which will be going through this wire when the alternator is not running, then it will automatically go click and disconnect. So you can use this battery at your leisure without flattening that battery. That's a voltage sensing relay. Uh, you also get other types of split charge relays, such as ones that are connected um, to your ignition by a wire. So it just knows when your key is turned. Um, it's worth looking into them, but I, I would recommend the Voltage Sense Relay. Um, they're, they're very cheap. Um, that's what I've been using for the past two or three years. I'd recommend going online, having a look around, looking at different types of uh, split charge relay kits. Um, it's a good place to start. I bought my kit for around about 60 or 70 pounds. That came with the relay. It also came with all the wiring that I needed for here. And um, like I said, this is a, quite a simplified diagram, so you'll have You'll have a fuse there, for instance. Have a look at the kits. They usually come with instructions and everything you need with them. Just for clarity, um, the way this is wired in, I've got the heavy duty wire, which came with the relay kit connected to the positive terminal on my main starter battery. This is fused here. The wire goes through the firewall. I've fed it all the way underneath the floor there. It comes out here and that goes into my cupboards and straight into the relay just like it showed on the diagram. And then it comes out of the relay, is fused again there. And then that goes directly to the positive terminal on the leisure battery. The leisure battery has 
a negative, a heavy duty negative going down to the chassis there. You can see I've cut a hole in the floor to connect that to the chassis of the vehicle. Please ignore my use of red wires for negative wires. That's bad practice. That's because I ran out of black wire. Please don't copy that. Um, the relay itself is also ground. That can either go to the chassis, anywhere on the chassis, um, or it can go directly back to the negative terminal on the leisure battery like I've done here. So what I'm going to do now is just demonstrate the uh, split charging in action. I've got a voltmeter here. This is connected to the main starter battery under the bonnet. So 12.4 volts, that's what that's putting out. The brains, as it were, behind the circuit is the split charge relay. You can see it says on there, cut in 13.3 volts, cut out 12.8 volts. When I turn the engine on, the alternator is going to kick in, the voltage is going to rise to 14 something, that's going to be charging the battery, and we're going to see the split charge relay light come on at some point. That is going to mean that the, the battery in the back is being charged as well. Just let the glow plugs warm up. Okay, so we can see this rising now to 14 plus, the split charge relay should have come on by now. And that is now charging both batteries. So I'm going to switch the engine off. Voltage is going to drop down to 12 again, gradually, and at some point the split charge relay will click off again. There we go. Obviously you can purchase batteries, leisure batteries, specific leisure batteries. Personally, I've just got a car battery, uh, which is fine for my needs, but I'm usually just charging my phone or powering a light. Um, it's worth looking into this. A deep cycle battery, aka leisure battery, is designed um, to be drained all the way and recharged. It can cope with doing that over and over again, and you're gonna get a longer life on it, all that kind of stuff is designed for that use. A car battery is designed basically for a very short, quick burst of power, i.e. starting your engine. Uh, so this here has got lots of lead plates that sit in acid, and this will have more than that one because this needs the higher surface area for that sudden burst of energy. If you're gonna be using your leisure battery a lot, a lot of heavy usage, it's worth getting a deep cycle battery. They are more expensive. Um, however, if you're like me and you just use it not very often and not heavy use then a car battery is fine that's going to be cheaper but yeah this is what you want if you want a good setup so that's the basics of installing the leisure battery covered uh, the next stage uh, is going to be wiring appliances to your leisure battery that's a little bit more complicated uh, to get that right because there are there are quite a few safety aspects involved in that All right, so let's say we've bought this little light here. Um, just for simplicity, we're assuming that the switch is built into the light. So on the back of here, we've just got a positive and a negative connection. Now, let's assume our leisure battery is all installed here. This is coming from the split charge relay. This is all charged, good to go. And we've got our light, we want to wire them up. So all you really need to do is you need a negative going from the light to the chassis of the vehicle. You can alternatively have this wire going all the way straight back to the negative terminal if you choose, it doesn't make any difference. And then we're going to be taking a positive wire from the leisure battery to the positive input on the light. That's the simplest way of doing it. However, there is more to it than this. I did mention that there were safety aspects involved. This is because wire can heat up and be a fire hazard if you have too much current going through it. Um, so obviously what we need to do to avoid that from happening is we need a fuse. Now the fuse goes on the positive wire as close to the positive terminal on the battery as possible. The reason for this is the circuit is only really fused 
after the fuse. So all the way from the fuse to the light, all the way back to here is fused. This short section here isn't actually fused. So if this wire to, were to rub around, for instance, um, and get a little bit of a, if this, if this coating was eroded and the metal, for instance, touched metal on your vehicle somewhere, that could cause a short circuit. Uh, so let's look at what happens when a short circuit happens. Now this poor little eight amp wire here, if I'd have held that on for much longer, this would start to heat up and that could be a fire hazard. That's what we want to avoid. In the wiring from my battery all the way up to my light, it goes through all sorts of corners, it's twisted, there's a lot of movement with the van and a short circuit could happen, that is a possibility. So what you want, you want to make sure there is a fuse here as near to the positive terminal as possible and um, that ensures that all of this wire is protected. Now you need to make sure that the amp rating on your fuse is actually the weakest point in the whole circuit. So I've got eight amp wire here. If this was all eight amp wire for the whole circuit, positive and negative, you'd need a fuse which is lower than eight amps. So I would put a five amp fuse on a circuit that's using eight amp wire. If I got this the wrong way around, say I was using five amp wire and an eight amp fuse, then the fuse would essentially be useless because if the wire is the weakest point in the link, then that's gonna to start to heat up. If there's too much current going through it, this is gonna burst into flames. We want this to be the weakest link in the whole circuit. And that means if there is a problem, if there's a surge of electricity, a short circuit, anything like that, that is gonna be the first thing to break. And that is how a fuse keeps us safe on a circuit. So what this means essentially is before we can select which wire we're using and which fuse we're using, we need to actually figure out how much current, how, mu how many amps our appliance is going to be using. Okay, so this fan is something that I use in the summer quite a lot. And this plugs into the cigarette lighter um, here. Now that is about the only thing that I use a cigarette lighter for. So I wired and fused this based on the power usage for this. Now this came from eBay. All it says on it is 25 watts. We want to know the amp rating because we, we need to know how many amps to use for our fuse and how many amps to use for the wiring for it. But we know it's 25 watts. We know that the battery in the whole system is 12 volts, um, standard car battery, and we can figure out the amps using that. So as long as you know two of these, you can always figure out the third. We know that it's 25 watts, that's what the fan is. We know that it's 12 volts, so all we need to do is 25 divided by 12, and we will get the amps that this fan is going to be using. So 2.08333 recurring, that is roughly the amount of amps that this fan draws. So we want to wire and fuse the circuit for the cigarette lighter based on an appliance that's going to be using 2.083 amps. You always want to round that up a little bit as well, just for inefficiencies, that kind of thing. So we're just going to call that three, three amps. So we take a diagram of our circuit here. We know that this is using three amps. Now what you want to do is you want to make sure your fuse what's on the circuit here is higher than three amps. If your fuse was below three amps, if you had a 2.5 amp fuse, it'd be safe, but it'd be constantly blowing, be constantly popping and you have to replace it, it'd be a nuisance. So you want a fuse here, which is five amps. That's what I've got on the circuit. And you want to make sure the wire is more heavy duty than that on the whole circuit, both the positive and the negative. So I put eight amp wire. You can go as high as you want. I mean, that could be a hundred amp wire and it wouldn't cause any problems, but that gets more expensive and more of a nuisance to fit. Just make sure that the fuse is the weakest point on the whole circuit, that it's as near as you can get it to the positive terminal. And most importantly, that all of your wire is heavier duty than the fuse. If you are adding a fuse onto the circuit, you can get these in line 
little fuse boxes here and you can just plug the blade fuses into there. You can see that that is a 20 amp fuse that goes to my subwoofer and I've taken that directly from the positive terminal on the battery. What you can do is you can get a fuse, a handy fuse box like this. This has just got a positive wire that goes all the way from the positive terminal into the fuse box and then you've got four outlets there for different appliances. That makes it handy, but as long as you're using something that is going to safely keep a fuse in the right place on the positive wire. So something that's really worth thinking about before you install a leisure battery is, do you even need one? I spend three, maybe four weeks of the year living in this van at the most, and when I'm in here, I charge my mobile phone and I operate this one watt light bulb and to be honest that's mostly all I use the laser battery for and they're both they're both devices that could be easily powered from the main starter battery really think about your usage your needs if you've got hair straighteners anything that's generating heat um, or if you're powering a TV depends what you're doing but uh, look into it might not even be worth installing one so that about covers the basics and I hope this has been helpful to somebody. I would just like to state I'm not a trained electrician so it's always worth seeking professional advice if you're doing this kind of work. So I can only advise doing that. But this setup has worked absolutely fine for me for the past two or three years. And if anyone has any suggestions, anything that I've done wrong or said wrong, please say below and uh, see you in the next one. Cheers.